Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to our uh, seminar today. Uh, we, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Lucan, uh, who is at Grant Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Uh, professor Lucan is the Silver Professor of Computer Science and Neural Science at, uh, uh, at Grant, at NYU. And uh, he received uh, his electrical engineering uh, diploma from Ecole Superior d'Ingenieur en Electrotechnique et Electronique in, in uh, Paris, France and then uh, got his PhD at uh, University of Pierre Marie Curie, again in Paris. Uh, he did a, a postdoc at University of Toronto prior to joining at and Bell Labs in 96, in 1988, I'm sorry, and then uh, joined the at and Research Department in image uh, analysis uh, in 96. Uh, he joined NYU as a full professor in 2003 after uh, I don't know if some of you guys remember the, all the uh, upheaval with AT&T and the breakup of AT&T and things. He went to NEC Research uh, uh, prior to that. Uh, he went to the uh, Research Institute in Princeton. Uh, he did, he's very well known in, uh, in the area of machine learning and uh, computer vision and computational <coughs> neuroscience. He's uh, widely published uh, with a lot of uh, book chapters. In, uh, on different topics from uh, neural networks, handwriting, uh, recognition, and uh, also image compression and BLSI design. Uh, he's also very well known for his uh, technology that he introduced. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this called uh, Deja Vu or Deja Vu uh, in French, and uh, which is widely, of course, uh, used now in in industry like uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, etc., uh, He's been on the editorial board of uh, the International Journal of Computer Vision, IEEE PAMI, and IEEE Neural Networks. He was the chair, program chair of CVPR 06, and was also the chair of the annual learning uh, workshop uh, in the US. Uh, he's also on the advisory board of the IPAM. I am sure uh, some of you know the Institute of Pure Applied Math at UCLA, which is, of course, uh, uh, sort of prides itself in being at the interface of uh, mathematics and engineering. So it's a pleasure to have him here today. And he'll be talking about his research in deep learning. It's a pleasure to have you. Floor is yours. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Hamid. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'll, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a number of different things, but uh, the common theme is the idea of uh, learning features um, for recognition in general, computer vision in particular. And um, I think there is a, a big challenge uh, in, in machine learning, in vision, in signal processing, AI in general, and neuroscience as well. And it's the problem of how do we learn perception from scratch? How, how is it that... Uh, animals and humans uh, seem to be able to solve the vision problem really easily without even thinking about it. And we still have the hardest problems uh, doing this with computers. And I think one of the problems that we need to address if you want to build artificial vision systems and AI systems going forward is the problem of learning representations uh, of the world or representations of the data. And it's a problem that the machine learning community has been mostly ignoring, um, at least until very recently, uh, it's, um, uh, machine learning has been concentrating on doing things like learning classifiers um, and assuming that the representation of the world, the feature vectors, uh, were somehow given, um, uh, usually as a result of kind of uh, expensive uh, human labor or engineering. Um, but with good representations, there's a lot of things we can do, and if we can learn them from data, it would be uh, most useful. It would kind of generalize the applicability of a lot of machine learning techniques to a lot of situations where we just don't have the, um, you know, the, the human power to kind of uh, figure out how to formulate, formulate the problem in the, in the uh, appropriate way. There's also another question, which is kind of uh, kind a of secondary interest of mine, uh, which is, you know, understanding how biological perception uh, works, uh, understanding how the brain works, essentially, or, how, or you know, what's the learning algorithm of the, of the cortex? Perhaps that's a simple question. And so that's what deep learning is about. It's about the, the problem not just of, of learning a, a classifier, which you could think of as the last stage of a recognition system, 
but it's the problem of learning the entire process from raw input to, uh, to categories. So that's kind of the, the standard architecture that, um, of, of, of most pattern recognition systems, and that includes computer vision systems, where you have an input, you have some sort of module that uh, turns this into uh, a set of features or representations appropriate for, for classification, and then you plug your favorite learning algorithm on top, uh, you know, logistic regression, super vector machines, neural nets, whatever you want. Um, and all the work goes into this, uh, unfortunately. Uh, in fact, that picture is a little kind of dated. Uh, really what people do nowadays is more like this, uh, at least for things like computer vision and speech recognition. There are generally two stages of, of feature extraction, one of which is completely engineered. Um, in the case of speech, it would be things like uh, male scale uh, correlation coefficient. In the case of images, it would be feature, feature sets like SIFT and HOG. So those are engineered by hand. And then the second stage very often uh, refines this representation in, in, into kind of a slightly higher level, uh, higher level one. And that usually exploits some form of learning, but it's in, unsupervised. So it doesn't use the, the labels from, from the data set, only the inputs. Uh, it uses techniques like k-means and sparse coding and things of that type. And then the classifier comes. So that's kind of the more modern view of uh, standard mainstream approaches to uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, pattern recognition and computer vision. Uh, but basically what we'd like to do is replace this model by one a little bit more like this where uh, we have kind of a succession of modules, each of which transforms the representation into a slightly higher level one with more invariance to the things that are, the, the, with, to the variability of the inputs that are irrelevant, uh, more sensitivity to the things that are relevant for the task. Um, and, um, and we'd like to make each of those modules uh, trainable somehow so that they can tune themselves to the task at hand. And if you look at, uh, if you try to get some inspiration from sort of weak, loose inspiration from biology, it's very much the way biology seems to, do, to be doing things. So this is a picture from uh, a, a neuroscientist uh, uh, in France called Simon Thorpe. And um, he, I mean, you know, he's not the only one to, adver to advertise this. His, his, uh, uh, his picture actually is uh, really the indication of the, the timing here of, of how recognition takes place in the in the, in the cortex. So images form on the retina and they get propagated to a series of uh, uh, neural modules if you want to think of them this way. There are areas in the, visual, in the cortex. Uh, this is called the ventral pathway and they, they're called you know, V1, V2, V4 and then the infratemporal cortex. And so this sort of extracts edges and this sort of assembles them into little mo uh, motifs and this sort of detects kind of slightly larger motifs and, and, and this encodes object categories pretty much. Okay, but still in the, in the visual form. And the whole process of recognition here is extremely fast. It takes less than 100 milliseconds. When you know how much delay there is in a neuron, you realize that there can't be that much of a complicated process going on there because there is barely enough time for you know, a few spikes of the neural signal to propagate through the entire thing in 100 milliseconds. And so the argument is that at least for simple everyday recognition tasks, you know, things that we can recognize without thinking about it, the process of recognition is essentially a feedforward propagation. There is no reasoning, there is no relaxation, there is no recurrent things. It's very, very simple. Um, and there's sort of you know, other work in neuroscience. Uh, this is Gallant and Vanessa and also kind of talking about this sort of ventral pathway. There's this sort of other area for, for vision that are more, have more to do with localizing objects rather than recognizing it. Um, so, so the idea of kind of a hierarchical process uh, is, is, is certainly what the, the brain seems to use. Uh, another element also that uh, is, is important is that uh, vision is very expensive computationally, uh, not just for our computers, but also for our brains. Uh, uh, in, in humans and, and, and primates, uh, about a, a quarter to a third of the brain is devoted to vision. Uh, it's an enormous amount of compute power, if you, if you want to formulate, formulate it in those terms. And um, it, it sort of tells you that vision is intrinsically difficult because if there was kind of a simple way of solving it, evolution probably would have found a way of, you know, making this faster and smaller. It's extremely expensive to maintain such a big brain. So there was, there was a way to shrink it. Um, it's, quite, it's quite possible that uh, nature would have found a way to do it. Uh, and so the fact that it's so big means that it's really computationally expensive and there's no way around it. Um, so... Um, Right, so, so this is kind of a, 
if you want sort of biological argument for why we should use hierarchical process to, to do uh, recognition. But there's another argument, which is a slightly more theoretical one. And, um, and first, I'm going to talk about the counter-argument. Okay? So the counter-argument, which comes from learning theory, is the fact that uh, the most uh, common uh, uh, architecture for a recognizer these days is uh, something like a super vector machine or a kernel machine. And a kernel machine represents a decision about, uh, about an object x as a weighted sum of the application of a kernel function, which essentially measures the similarity or dissimilarity between the input vector and each of the training samples in the in a training set, right? So you figure out, you know, um, how similar is x to all of the training samples with some sort of measure of some kind. You do a weighted sum of that, which you train, and that gives you the the category of the object. So it's kind of uh, you know glorified template matching, and there are theoretical arguments that show that you can pretty much approximate any uh, uh, any categorization of any training set with a, a function of this form. So, you know, if you don't dig into this, you say, well, why do you need anything else? Uh, that seems to be just fine. The problem, of course, is that you, can, you could have a very, very, very large number of uh, terms in that sum. Um, so, you know, it's common to have uh, data sets now with millions of uh, training samples, and it's completely impractical to compare images, millions of images like this. Um, you end up with, um, uh, okay, that, so that's one problem. The second problem is who is going to give you the kernel function that allows you to compare images in, in a way that makes sense? And we don't have it. I mean, we have to go back to extracting features and then uh, doing things like that. So this doesn't solve the problem. Um, now, why is it that uh, something like, you know, uh, a kind of a sequential process uh, would, would solve that problem? Uh, where you have sort of trainable parameters. So here I kind of symbolize this by, you know, what could be thought of as a multilayer neural net or some version of this. I'm not specifying what the f function is. But, you know, take an input vector, multiply it by some matrix, apply some nonlinear some non function to it, and then repeat the process uh, uh, k times. Um, so you have, you know, a number of nonlinear non steps and a number of linear transformations in between. Yes? Yeah. So I have a question about that first point you mentioned. About the two problems? Uh -huh. Uh, the other problem which I, I commonly encounter in machine learning, I want your opinion on how, how big a problem that is. About, so using these similarity functions, we are trying to divide the space into these different uh, groups and use that to classify, right? So there's another problem that how good are the training samples in dividing that space? You see, sometimes the training samples may not be very good descriptive of what's happening in real life. Well, you kind of have you kind of have to assume that they are. The problem is, you know, how many of them do you have? So, if you want to be able to recognize every possible image in the world, you know, you can imagine, uh, you know, have a super duper version of Google Street View where you take every possible picture in the world and you have them all in a big data set. And if you have a super fast way of comparing everything to everything, you can recognize everything that exists in the world. Of course, it's completely impractical, uh, but you know, it's possible in principle. Um, so we, we're talking about practical things, you know, how to reduce. Uh, so, you know, there's the issue of variability. So, you know, the, the number of different ways uh, that, uh, you know, a particular object can appear uh, depending on the orientation, the illumination, the background, et cetera. Uh, if you want to cover the space of, of everything in such a way that a simple comparison uh, will, will, will tell you something useful, uh, you need a number of samples that's ridiculously large. Um, so, you know, it's, it's impractical. It's completely hopeless. Um, but um, uh, so so w w what is there about uh, about uh, you know sequential process that that might make this useful? So as as engineers, I'm, I'm sure you're you've you've designed a few logic circuits, and you probably all know that you can uh, compute any Boolean function with two layers of um, of Boolean functions. That's called a disjunctive normal form or a conjunctive normal form. You put a bunch of ands, a few nots, and a bunch of ors. And you, ha you can compute whatever function you want. The problem is you might need an exponential number of min terms for any particular function, right? In fact, there is a is an exponentially small number of function of n bits that happen to have a non-exponential number of min terms. Uh, most of them have an exponential number of min, of, of min terms. So, um, so how how do we solve the problem as uh, circuit engineers? Uh, we just allow ourselves to use more than just two layers, right? So, if you build a, a binary adder, you're gonna you know, add two bits and then propagate the carry, and add two bits, propagate the carry. So now your circuit has, has depth n, uh, or kn. 
um, where n is number of input bits, but its, its complexity is linear in the number of, uh, of, of bits. Uh, same with XOR, you can do a tree of XORs, uh, but if you do it in two layers, you need a ridiculously large number of, uh, of gates. So, um, so depth, uh, you know, a few more layers in depth reduces the, the overall amount of stuff you need to use by possibly an exponential uh, factor. That's the, that's the best argument I know for deep learning, really. It's an engineering argument. I have a hard time convincing computer scientists of this, but um, you know, they, will, they, will, they will say, well, you know, are there theoretical results about complexity class, blah, blah, blah. That's not what and <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, so the cool thing about uh, deep, uh, deep learning and feature learning is that, uh, and it's a bit of a preview, is uh, it's become very successful very quickly. So the, the, the whole idea of sort of training deep neural nets has been around for 25 years. Uh, in fact, that was the very reason why neural nets uh, started getting uh, uh, popular in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, but it didn't work that, it didn't work that well. And the, the, the whole topic was, was kind of revived uh, around 2005, 2006, uh, mostly by uh, Jeff Hinton and Yosha Benjo, me, Andrew Ng, a couple other people. And now it's in products. So if you, uh, if you have an Android phone and you use the voice search in Android 4.0, it uses a deep learning system. Uh, the acoustic modeling in the speech recognition system uses a deep neural net. Um, and, um, and so it went from sort of, you know, um, not, very well pop not very popular academic research to, uh, you know, the handsets of millions of people in basically five years. Um, and it's been used before for you know various other things. Uh, it's it's one of the hottest topics in, in speech recognition today for that reason. Um, also, it's becoming pretty hot in computer vision and natural language processing. And um, and there's a lot of applied mathematici ma mathematicians who are really interested in in the in this process. So if we're going to apply uh, deep learning to computer vision, uh, we still have to figure out what to put in those little boxes that I was uh, mentioning earlier. The adaptive boxes that will turn that will transform the the features, and basically what we've converged uh, uh, towards in the, in the last few years is something like this, where you take the, the raw input, you first do a little bit of normalization, which you can think of as a cheap form of, uh, of whitening. So something that would decorrelate the inputs, uh, decorrelate the variables of that, that come from the input. You know, it would be something like a high-pass filter if you, if you feed it natural images. Uh, something that normalizes the, the variances. Um, so basically whitening, okay, but a cheap form of it. Um, then you apply a filter bank, where, which is going to be trained, uh, which is going to extract local features uh, from the image, if you were talking about image, an image. So this would be a bunch of convolutions, okay, very simple. Then we're going to apply some sort of nonlinear transformation to that. Uh, and it's very important that it's, that it's nonlinear. If it's linear, then the whole thing is linear and there's no point having multiple layers, obviously. Um, and then we're going to do what's called feature pooling. So we're going to take the response, and, and, and generally the, the, the filter here, we're going to have a large number of filters in such a way that the dimensionality of the representation here is going to be higher than the dimensionality here. Okay? It's, it's going to be an expansion. Um, in the brain, that expansion is by a factor of 50, roughly, in the first area of the visual cortex. Uh, but we can't necessarily afford that here. Um, and so the, the feature pooling operation is going to consist in taking... Uh, uh, the response of some of those filters and sort of aggregate them, um, aggregating them uh, using a symmetric function like an average or max or a you know a log of sum of exponentials or something like that or or, a, or an LP norm, okay. And the point of this is to regroup together things that uh, are supposed to be similar in the you know semantically. Um, and you know this, this seems a little ab abstract right now, but I'll, I'll tell you more about this la later. You'll be able to understand. And then we repeat the process. So we kind of we, we repeat this kind of stage uh, multiple times, uh, two or three times generally. And then we stick a classifier on top. And the classifier can be seen as just another norm and filter bank and nonlinearity. Um, so uh, <coughs> so if if you look at the the classical way of doing or the, the mainstream way of doing computer vision it actually conforms to that model as well. So the SIFT or HOG feature extractor actually does exactly this kind of series of operations, except that the filters are designed by hand. Uh, here we're going to learn them. Um, 
And so the first attempts at, at doing things like this for, for object recognition uh, using an unsupervised learning setting were uh, due to Fukushima in the 70s and 80s. And I started working with models like this in the uh, early, uh, late 80s when I uh, was at Bell Labs. Um, and there's kind of a whole bunch of people who have kind of embarked on, the, on this kind of model more recently. Um, and we call this a convolutional net for obvious reasons because the filters are convolutional. So uh, that's a representation of it here where we start with the input image. We do this normalization step that I was telling you about, high pass filtering, contrast normalization. Um, and then we apply a bunch of filters to it so we get the response of each filter as a plane. We call each of the plane a feature map. Uh, and then pass through the nonlinearity. And then the pooling operation takes a little patch of features uh, in, in one feature map or sometimes in multiple feature maps and then computes the average or the square root of sum of square or something like that of those values. And we subsample that. So we decimate that so that uh, we get a lower dimensional representation, um, I mean a lower resolution representation that here than we had here. And that actually is originally inspired by biology. You can connect this with classical work in biology by uh, Hubel and Weasel from the early 60s and late 50s where they explain the architecture of the visual cortex in terms of what they call simple cells and complex cells. And simple cells are neurons that react to a local neighborhood on the input which looks very much like a you know, the, the little convolution kernel, if you want. Uh, generally, they react to uh, um, oriented uh, edges. And then the complex cells integrate the response of those filters over a small area so that you get a bit of an invariance with respect to shift. Um, so in fact, that's another example of one of those convolutional nets. Um, but that's a slightly more interesting version of it. So this is a, an old one that I, I trained, uh, you know, this is, this is back from the early 90s, uh, yeah, early 90s. And, and so this, uh, this uh, convolutional net here looks at a, a handwritten digit. And the reason I'm showing this to you is, uh, is, is twofold. The first is to show you the response of, of those filters, which are all trained. I'll tell you in a minute how it's trained. Um, and uh, the result of the uh, pooling and subsampling, there's also nonlinearity here. Um, and then we repeat the process. So each of these guys actually combines the response of the filters from multiple maps. So it applies filters to multiple maps. They're all added together and then passed through nonlinearity. And each of those guys combines a different subset of those uh, maps in the previous layer. So those are kind of sort of high level, more abstract, more global features, subsampling and pooling again. Um, and again, another layer of filters. Uh, but now the filter, uh, the, the height of the filter is the same height as the feature map here, uh, which means that the, the resulting map is, is only one pixel tall, if you want. Um, and so if you take one slice, one vertical slice of values here, it represents, it encodes as a feature vector the content of a 32 by 32 window on the input, okay? If we back project the influence of those variables. So one reason I'm showing this to you is that if you look at this particular pixel here, um, it goes from white to black to white, okay? Uh, or maybe this one. And you know, there's a whole bunch of those pixels here that will go from white to black to white. What that means is that in the space of pixels, the surface of translated threes is highly nonlinear. It's, it's got a curvature to it, okay? Because at least one of the coordinates goes from one value to another value back to another value, back to the original value. So it's gotta be curved, it can't be flat, right? In fact, it's very highly curved. Not only is it highly curved, um, it's very difficult to separate that manifold of all the translated threes from the manifold of all the translated eight because if I draw an eight, it will have most of the pixels in common with that three. So the manifold of threes and eights are very close to each other because they have many pixels in common. And when you translate a three and you translate the eight, you know, you, you move on those two manifolds. They don't intersect, but they're very sort of intricate, you know, intricate, you know, one into the other. You can't really, they're sort of entangled. You can't separate them easily with a, say, a linear classifier, right? Um, now, look at the representation here at the end. Uh, what happens here is that you hardly see any value that goes from white to black to white or vice versa. They go from more gray to less gray or from black to white or from white to black. Um, and what that tells you is that the, the manifold of, of you know, representations here of, of the translated three is flatter. So it's a lot easier to separate it from other manifolds for other digits. Uh, how does that happen? It just happens as a side effect of training the system uh, in supervised mode. So the way we train it is you show an input, propagate through, you get an answer, compare the answer to the answer you want, 
and then compute the gradient of the square of the, the sum of the square of the difference between the answer you want and the answer you get. Maybe it's not that loss function, it's a different one, but it doesn't matter. Um, compute the gradient of that with respect to all the filter coefficients uh, in your system, and then do a step of gradient. And then go to the next sample and do that again. So it's uh, st uh, stochastic gradient descent minimization. It's very much like an adaptive filter, except it's nonlinear, right? Um, so uh, let me skip this. You can apply this to all kinds of different things, uh, you know, recognizing digits or uh, uh, road signs or, or, you know, house numbers and detect pedestrian. And it's basically the best method there is for all of those, uh, all those problems. Uh, Wherever there's been a competition uh, where, where th you know, lots of methods have been compared, sort of a publicly open competition, for this kind of recognition problem, it's always a convolutional net that wins. And in some cases, in the case of uh, road sign recognition, uh, there was a competition recently organized by a German um, uh, institution. I think there were over 200 entries, and the top uh, 13, 13 out of the top 14 were convolutional net. And um, the fourteenth one actually was number six, and that was human performance. <laughs> um, and out of those thirteen uh, convolutional nets, uh, six were from my lab, and seven from a, a lab in Switzerland uh, called Itia. Um, but basically, using our, our, our methods with some tweaks. Uh, so those things have been used commercially for all kinds of uh, applications, uh, including some that I built at AT&T back in the nineties. Uh, and this is the purely supervised uh, version that I was just mentioning. Uh, Google uses them for various applications, uh, NEC as well for all kinds of applications. Um, Microsoft has used them also for, for various, various things. So they, they've been used, they've been around. Uh, one of the latest applications that we built in my lab was for scene parsing. It's a very difficult uh, problem in computer vision which consists in not just recognizing objects, but basically labeling every pixel of an image with the category of the object that that pixel belongs to. Right, so you have a, a street picture like this, and you know the, some pixels are road and people and building, sky, tree, etc. Um, so we used a convolutional net, but we made it multi-scale. So the, the big problem there is that you look at one pixel and you can't tell if the pixel, if it's a gray pixel, it could be the sky, it could be the road, it could be a sidewalk, it could be anything, right? So to decide on the category of a pixel, you need you need to use a very large uh, context to to see it in context. And so we use a convolutional net where when you go back, when you go all the way to the output, so you have a number of, of, of categories here, um, the, uh, uh, a particular uh, output vector here, so there are uh, 33 categories in this particular uh, problem here. So we have 33 maps indicating the probability of a pixel belonging to uh, one of the 33 categories. And one particular output here when you back project uh, corresponds to a 48 by 48 input on the, on the image, and 48 by 48 is not always enough to decide what a pixel is. Uh, you need to, do, to look at a bigger context. So what we did was subsample the image by a factor of two, basically build a pyramid. It's actually more like something like a Laplacian pyramid. And, um, and so now you, have, you apply the same convolutional net to, the, to, to this output, exactly the same one. And um, the 48 by 48 window now covers uh, twice as much of the image as before because the image is half the size. And here, this you know, 48, uh, 46 by 46 window covers pretty much the entire image. Um, so you run the, the three copies of this convolutional net in parallel. You get those feature maps. Those feature maps, of course, are, are lower resolution than this one. So you upsample them so that they match the resolution of the previous one. And then you take the combined features, high resolution, mid resolution, low resolution, and you uh, plug them to a classifier. And the entire thing is, is, tra excuse me, is trained in supervised mode. Um, and it's trained on fully labeled images, uh, about 2,000 of them usually. Um, and what you get are, are results that are okay, but not perfect and or you know, not completely state of the art. And the problem is that the, the boundaries between the, the objects are a little fuzzy. Um, so we play a trick and it's a very simple trick, uh, which a lot of people working on this kind of problem uh, use in a different way. And so we, we do what's called a super pixel segmentation. So using kind of graph uh, uh, partitioning uh, uh, algorithms, we find kind of little regions that are likely to contain similar pixels. And what we do is we take the output uh, categories coming out of the, of the convolutional net and we do a majority vote over each of those super pixels. So that a super pixel is classified as the class that wins within, the, within that super pixel, right? 
And that sort of cleans out the boundaries. So instead of having fuzzy boundaries that are not lined up, uh, we get uh, clean ones. Um, we have another technique to, to do this, which I'm not going to go into. Um, and the cool thing is that it pretty much beats the record on every data set that we've tried. Um, so this is the multi-scale plus super pixel technique. This is a multi-scale net plus other techniques to kind of refine the, the, the boundary. And uh, the best published result is, uh, is this in terms of pixel accuracy, which counts how many pixels are correct. But it's actually a bad measure. The, be the better measure is called class accuracy. And that normalizes uh, the performance uh, in, um, in proportion to the number of pixels of each category. So for example, if you have uh, images that are, have a majority of sky and, uh, and grass and road, if you just get the grass and road properly, you can ignore the people, the bicycles, the cars, and everything. And it, since they don't occupy many pixels, you'll get a pretty good performance. Um, so that's not a very good measure if you miss most of the objects in the, category, in the, in the image. This one says, OK, I make you pay more for missing a person, because there are fewer pixels in that person, and so it's more, impor more important. And on that measure, we, uh, we pretty much beat every other method previously published. And not only that, uh, so if you look at this line, so we beat the record here, but we also beat it in speed. We, we can do this about 100 times faster than everybody else, because it's the speed forward, very fast process. Uh, those things are slow because they use very complicated graphical models with you know, a sort of inference to kind of make sure all the decisions are consistent with each other. And that's the same trick that we play here, and it boosts the performance a little bit. Um, the, uh, the tables at the bottom are, uh, so this is a, an A category uh, uh, data set. This one is a 33 category data set, data set, which is much more interesting. And again, here we uh, beat uh, the previously published results on this data set uh, by a small margin on pixel accuracy, but a very large margin on class accuracy. Um, and this is a pretty much infeasible one with 170 categories uh, where you know nobody does particularly well, but we do slightly less bad than uh, the previous people. Um, and so this is, uh, I mean, this work here from uh, Stanford, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford. Uh, this, this is uh, UNC, actually, uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, although she moved to UAUC now, but, um, and this is from uh, Oxford. Uh, so this, looks, this, this works really well. Uh, we can uh, label images pretty reliably, or all the regions um, very well, even identifying windows and doors and uh, sand and you know things like that. And so what we did was we, uh, we uh, had a guy in my lab wear a helmet with a, a sort of a panoramic USB camera, so basically you know, six cameras around, around his, his head and back around uh, Washington Square Park, which is at the core of uh, NYU uh, uh, campus. So here is driving down uh, Washington Square Place. And we use kind of a frame-by-frame -frame system here. We just apply the system on, on individual frames and label every pixel. Um, the training set comes from Barcelona. So you know New York is very different from Barcelona. Uh, but there are mistakes that are stupid. Uh, so sometimes you know it will label when the lighting is bad, it will label the, the road uh, as, as a beach, you know, like sand, right? Uh, which really doesn't make sense. Um, and so, you know, it's not using any kind of global contextual information as to the fact that this is street view and you can't have sand. Uh, but it does a pretty good job otherwise. Um, you see the, the shadow of the guy driving the, the bike here with his uh, helmet. It looks like he, he has horns on his head, but it's really the cameras. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it gets the sky and the buildings and the trees and, um, no, it thinks this is a car, which is obviously not the case. Uh, grabs the people. So there's lots of applications of things like this if we can make this work uh, well uh, and in real time, particularly for things like, you know, drivers, uh, driving assistance for cars and things like this. Uh, Obstacle detection for for autonomous robots and all kinds of uh, all kinds of applications. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> That's probably if you can use, if it works in New York, it works everywhere else. So uh, this is a another version of the system where instead of using instead of processing the images independently of each other, we do spatial temporal uh, um, 
uh, super pixel. So we, we look at the video and, and we look at uh, spatial temporal blocks of, of, of similar pixels. Uh, and we, uh, we give the same answer. So it gives much more stable um, uh, segmentations and, and classifications, except that it's not as good, unfortunately. It makes more mistakes. Um, okay, so now for the idea of, uh, uh, so all I, I showed you so far used supervised learning. Uh, but one of the stuff that's most interesting about deep learning is, is unsupervised learning. And, and, um, uh, and the idea of unsupervised learning is to use the, the large quantity of unlabeled images that we have or data that we have to pre-train a system before actually training it to solve the task, right? Um, and there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, the, the sort of various techniques and, and the, the various uh, labs that have been active in deep learning are, 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 using, are each using their favorite subset of techniques. Uh, so at, uh, uh, in Toronto, in Jeff Hinton's group, they use uh, something called restricted Boson machines. Uh, in Montreal, they use something called denoising autoencoder or contracting autoencoders. At uh, Stanford, they've used just about anything. And uh, in my lab, uh, we use a lot of sparse coding, things that are based on sparse coding or sparse autoencoders. So I'm going to start with explaining what sparse coding is about. It's a very good feature extraction method, if you haven't heard of it. Uh, so basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take say a patch from an image, we're going to call this Y, and then we're going to try to encode this patch, in the ima uh, this image patch, into a feature vector Z. Z is generally going to be higher resolution, uh, higher dimension than Y, okay? And we're going to try to find uh, a Z vector that has lots of zeros in it, and, uh, and it's such that when we multiply it by a so-called dictionary matrix, we reconstruct Y, okay? So basically, uh, we formalize that through an energy function of this type, where y is a particular image patch, z is going to be the vector that represents it. I'm going to try to find a z that minimizes the sum of those two terms. The first term is a reconstruction error, where we measure the discrepancy between the reconstruction, z multiplied by wd, uh, minus uh, the, the input, uh, norm squared. And then there's another term that's going to uh, try to make z as sparse as possible. And it's going to be the sum of the absolute values of the components of z. Okay? If you try to minimize this function, uh, what you're going to find is a z that uh, has lots of zeros in it because that's the best way to minimize this, but at the same time reconstructs that, okay? Uh, now, the cool thing about this is that there are algorithms since the late 90s invented by neuroscientists, as a matter of fact, to learn the uh, WD matrix, and it's very simple. You simply do gradient descent. So you show a Y, you find a Z that minimizes this for the current value of WD, okay? And once you have that Z, you tweak WD in such a way that uh, this error goes down. It's just least square, right? Uh, and you do, you do this with kind of a stochastic gradient descent method. And you have to normalize the columns of WD because otherwise uh, WD is going to go uh, very large so that Z can go very small and minimize this term. So you have to balance the, you have to normalize that for that to work. So this is due to Olsazen Field in 1997. And, uh, and it's become extremely popular for all kinds of applications, denoising, image denoising, and all kinds of stuff. Um, Right, the problem with this, of course, is that it's slow. So if I give you a y and I ask you what z corresponds to a y, you have to minimize this function. And that can take a while. If you have to do this for every image patch, it's going to take a long time. So the idea that we came up with, uh, so this is called a, uh, I mean, I call this a, a sort of decoder-only uh, kind of unsupervised learning. And there are other examples of, of, of such methods for unsupervised learning. You can cast methods like k-means into this kind of framework as well. So the idea we had a few years ago was to say, well, Okay, we can train this uh, decoding uh, system to reconstruct the input from the feature vector. But what we're going to do now is that if we have a Y and we have the corresponding sparse code that reconstructs uh, Y, we're going to train a feedforward machine to predict the Z from the Y. Okay, so we're going to have a, essentially what amounts to a, a simple, very simple neural net here. Uh, we're going to train this guy to, as a regressor, essentially, to predict to produce a good approximation of the optimal z for any given y. Now, this looks like a free lunch that it shouldn't be possible because why is it that this, this machine could produce uh, you know, z really quickly when, when here the way we produce it is through this complicated energy minimization process? But the point is we're not trying to predict z at every location in the input space. We're only trying to predict z for the y's that we are interested in, which are natural image patches. And so we can get away with it in a sense. Um, uh, so what it comes down to in the end is an energy function that looks like this, which has three terms now. 
one is the reconstruction term, the other one is the sparsity term, which you saw before. There's a third term, which we call the prediction term, which measures the discrepancy between whatever this guy predicts and whatever Z uh, ends up being. And we, do, we use the same training process, uh, show a Y, find the Z that minimizes this energy function, and then tweak WD to minimize this term and tweak WE to minimize that term. The GE function can be a number of different things, but the simplest uh, implementation uses what's called the shrinkage function, uh, which is a point, uh, pointwise uh, scalar function applied to uh, each component of the um, product of the input by WE. And so the shrinkage function is something like this. It's basically a function that shrinks uh, the value towards zero. So it makes some of them zero. So if you apply algorithms like this to uh, handwritten digits, uh, what I'm showing here are columns of the WD matrix or rows of the WE matrix, and they tend to be very similar to each other. And uh, uh, what it tells you is that you can reconstruct any handwritten digit as a linear combination of a small number of these guys. Okay, that's, what, that's the idea of sparse, uh, sparse coding. And what the system learns is that the best way to have a small number of parts that you can assemble to form digits are little pieces of strokes. Right? That makes complete sense. If you apply this to natural images, natural image patches, this is a learning algorithm running. Uh, what you end up at the end is, uh, is with uh, Gabor filters, oriented Gabor filters. Okay, so edge detectors, essentially. Uh, things like this. And this is exactly what neuroscientists observe uh, in the brain, the, the kind of receptive fields of simple cells very much look like this. Um, so there are sort of generalizations of this uh, idea of you know, feed-forward prediction of a complex optimization problem. And uh, uh, one of my postdocs, uh, Carol Greger, kind of pushed this idea a little further um, by sort of formulating a standard uh, uh, sparse coding algorithm called, called ISTA, uh, Iterative Shrinkage and Thresholding Algorithm, in terms of a recurrent neural net that you can train. Um, and that idea has been picked up by uh, uh, you know, a number of, of, uh, of different groups, among, among them uh, Guillermo Sapiro and uh, uh, Alex Bronstein. Uh, to, to do all kinds of stuff, uh, source separation and you know, all kinds of signal processing applications that use this idea of fast feed-forward prediction of a complex optimization problem. Um, okay, how do you use this for recognition? For recognition, we're going to build one of those convolutional nets, but we're going to pre-train it using this unsupervised method. So we're going to take an image patch. We're going to train this little sparse autoencoder I was telling you about before. Uh, and what it's going to give us is a feed-forward way of computing feature vectors. Once it's trained, unsupervised, we get rid of the decoder. We just keep the feed-forward path of it. And you could think of this as linear filter, nonlinearity, and that actually symbolizes the pooling. Here it's a little bit of an abuse. Then we stick the second stage on top of it, train that unsupervised, get rid of the feedback. And what you have now is a two-stage convolutional net. You can stick a classifier on top and train that or refine, fine-tune the entire architecture in supervised mode. And so if you do this and you apply this to kind of small data sets like Caltech 101 or things like this, it works pretty well. It's not record breaking, but it works pretty well. Uh, actually, let me not spend too much time on this because I don't have much time left. Um, and uh, let me skip that as well. Um, so there's a problem with this, though, which is that um, when, you, when you train this uh, unsupervised uh, system on image patches, uh, what you get is a, a little widget that wants to, to reconstruct every image patch uh, in isolation of all other image patches. And what you get is you get filters that are essentially shifted versions of each other so that a uh, horizontal edge in this case can be, re can be reconstructed whatever its location within the, the little patch. Right? And that sounds like a waste because we're going to use those filters in a convolutional manner anyway. And so you know, if you apply this filter and then that filter, you're going to get the same answer, just shifted. Right? So it seems like a complete waste. So what we should do is uh, train the filters uh, by letting them know they're going to be used in a convolutional manner. And so that's called convolutional sparse coding. Um, so normal, convolution, normal sparse coding is like this. That's I just a, a rewrote what I wrote before. But I explicitly wrote the sum over basis functions of the, uh, which are the, the, uh, the columns of, of, w, of, of WD, which I didn't know about WK here, uh, times ZK, which are scalars. Okay, so ZK are the coefficients, the, the, the components of the feature vector. Um, so now I'm going to rewrite this, but instead of ZK being a scalar, now it's an image. And instead of a multiplication of a scalar by a vector here, it's going to be a convolution of an image by a kernel. Okay? So it looks kind of like this. So the ZKs are images, or they are really feature maps. 
I'm going to convolve each of these feature maps by a little by, by a kernel. Uh, I'm going to sum up the results, and that's going to be my reconstruction. Okay, so now uh, the filters here, when we, when we train those those filters to 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 do this reconstruction, uh, we're not going to have to, you know, the filters are not going to need to have copies of themselves at all locations because they're already there due to the convolution operation. Uh, so various people have kind of worked on this uh, more or less simultaneously. This is uh, uh, my dear colleague at NYU, uh, Rob Fergus, who kind of built an entire system out of things like this. Um, and we, you know, we had kind of a, a slightly different way of doing it. And here's a result. It, it, it's, it's much nicer in the end than, than the original one. So the original uh, uh, sparse coding, you get those kinds of filters or basis functions, basically Gabor filters. But if you use this convolutional form, you get these very diverse filters, which include, um, uh, so first of all, you don't get replicated filters at, at all, loca at all you know, locations. You get more orientation selectivity. You get corner detectors. You get uh, gratings. You get center surround. Um, you get uh, you know, another corner. You get crosses. Uh, so you get all kinds of features that you wouldn't otherwise get where the system would have to kind of spend its resources on shifted versions of the filters. It looks very nice. On simple data sets, though, like Attack 101, it doesn't make much difference in performance. Uh, but it does for things like pedestrian detection. So I'm going to show you some examples of that. So this is a, a particular example of a commercial net that we train to detect pedestrians. So we take windows from images, and we, when there is a pedestrian in it, we say turn on, and we, there is no pedestrian, we say turn off. And we pre-train the system with this unsupervised method. And basically, uh, this beats all other published systems um, uh, for pedestrian detection, as far as we can say, uh, as we can tell, on the so-called INRIA data set, which admittedly is not a very large one or a very uh, particularly uh, uh, useful one in terms of practice, uh, practical applications. Uh, so what this curve shows is the uh, number of false positives per image in the x-axis and the uh, percentage of missed uh, pedestrians on the y-axis. And so this is for one false positive per image, and our system misses about 6.8%, uh, and the other ones are worse. You know, so the, the ideal system would be kind of down here. It's, it's, a, it's like a precision recall curve. It's not quite an RC curve. It's, the normalization is different, but it's similar. Um, and that's the difference between uh, the performance using this unsupervised pre-training or using just purely supervised training. So there's a bit of an improvement. Uh, this, these are for all the data sets that are more serious and again, uh, we seem to beat all, all the others. Uh, this, so the, the dark <coughs> blue line is, is our system right here. Um, and that's a little video of uh, the system uh, in action. Uh, so this is, again, uh, Washington Square uh, Park in the middle of NYU. And um, it pretty much detects everyone. It's only been trained to detect uh, people standing, so it's not going to work particularly well for people sitting sitting around. Which, uh, but it works. It works okay. That's another example. So here we uh, remove the non-maximum suppression, so you get uh, faint rectangles that are not pedestrians, which which indicates kind of low score hits. Um, so the high scoring ones are, are kind of more visible. Just to show the hypotheses that are being considered by the system. Um, and so the cool thing about learning features is that you can use exactly the same architecture, apply it to other kinds of data, like say, music. So in our case, so it's the same algorithm we used. Uh, you take a, what's called a constant Q transform. I don't know if you guys, you guys are engineers. You should, maybe you probably know about this. Constant Q transform. So it's kind of like an FFT, but the, uh, you know, the, I mean, it's kind of, it's like, like a filter bank where the, the, the bandwidth of each filter grows geometrically with its central frequency. So you get a constant number of, of, of filter bands per octave, okay? And so here we have, uh, uh, was that 48 uh, or 24? I think 24 bands per octave. Uh, so two per half tone, essentially. Um, and we span four octaves. And so we get, uh, so this is time going this way and frequency going that way, log, or log frequency, I should say. And, um, and then we do uh, some sort of contrastive, uh, contrast normalization, uh, high-pass filtering, and, uh, high and uh, 
you know, contrast uh, gain control, basically, local gain control. And then we, we apply this, uh, this convolutional net to it uh, using the unsupervised pre-training um, with sparse coding. And what we get is, is, is funny. We get filters or business functions that end up being uh, core detectors. So this is kind of a, so, so a filter here is going to be uh, essentially a function that looks at a slice, you know, a frequency slice, so one time slice of this, and it's going to have high coefficients at some places, low coefficients in other places. And we have two versions, one that looks at a single uh, octaves and one that looks at the entire uh, frequency uh, spectrum. And for single octave ones, you can look at the high coefficients and they basically line up on, on chords that are frequent in, in, in the music that we are considering. So minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, quarter chord, etc. cetera. Um, and you apply this to one of the standard data sets, which is actually a, a little, a, a bit small. It's kind of being phased out for a new one, but for copyright issue, it's very difficult to put your hands on uh, music data sets. Um, and this is our system. It pretty much matches the state of the art, which is that. Those two you should ignore. Uh, there were major uh, uh, methodological issues with those two papers. Basically, they trained on the test set. So, um, so those, those results are not to be believed. Um, uh, but I was told that after making the slide. So I keep them on because there's always a doubt that you know, it's kosher. But I've been told that it's really not. And so it pretty much matched the, the, the best system, which also uses deep learning, by the way, but a different technique for unsupervised pre-training. Um, let me skip this. Um, so the sort of different versions of this uh, sparse, sparse autoencoder method, some of which use what's called uh, group sparsity. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but it allows us to essentially um, uh, train locally invariant features together with the pooling operation. And I don't have time to go into the details. I just want to go into a little bit of uh, history here because this algorithm was used, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, back in July, there was an article that made the first page of the business section of the New York Times that Google had trained a very large neural network on a ver very large network of, uh, of machines, <coughs> of computers, with you know, 16,000 CPUs or something like this. And they trained a, a, a neural net on YouTube videos, and the stuff spontaneously kind of came up with cat detectors because there's so many cats in YouTube videos. You know. uh, and so there was a picture in the New York Times of you know, some sort of faint cat uh, which is a reconstruction of this unsupervised coding. And so what they use is basically this group sparsity, uh, sparse autoencoder. They, they give it a different name. Uh, this, this comes out of Andrew Ng's lab at Stanford. They call it RICA, but it's the, the, same, uh, uh, the, same, the same algorithm, essentially, this, this idea of group, group sparsity, unsupervised learning. And they use a convolutional net-like architecture, except that they don't, they don't share the weights uh, across location. Uh, the cool thing you, you, do, you, you can get out of those algorithms is uh, you can, um, they kind of spontaneously organize the features in topographic maps that kind of slowly vary. And so these are the groups over which we, we do group sparsity. And what this group sparsity uh, criterion leads to is that it tends to uh, regroup filters that are similar, that tend to fire together uh, into the groups. So here we arranged the, 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 the feature vector into a, a 2D array, a 2D topology. And the groups are just uh, local 2D 6 by 6 um, uh, groups of, of, uh, of features in this. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a torus. Um, and they overlap by, uh, by three, uh, three rows or three columns. Um, and so when we train the system, what happens is that the system tries to minimize the number of groups that are active at any one time. That's the sparsity uh, criterion. And the best way it can do this is by regrouping within a single group all the filters that tend to fire together. And so it tends to regroup similar filters within groups. And because it has this toroidal uh, to, uh, topology, it, it, it builds those kind of beautiful topographic maps. Uh, it's not very interesting for the point of view of, of recognition. But it turns out if you poke electrodes in the brain of, of, uh, of, of animals and you look at how the orientation selectivity varies as you move the needle, it looks very much like that. In fact, it looks more like, like that. Uh, that's a slightly different form of the algorithm. Um, and so this, this is out of the neuroscience paper where the color encodes the orientation selectivity. And this is the same encoding out of our algorithm. Uh, looks very similar, qualitatively at least. Um, 
Yeah, this is just a plug. It's a free advertising for uh, Stefan Mala's work on the scattering transform, which basically is a very interesting theoretical work that analyzes the mathematical properties of architectures that look very much like convolutional nets that I talked about, although they're kind of a, a bit of a special architecture. Uh, but I think it's very interesting work if you are mathematically inclined. I highly recommend that you look at this. It's very interesting for analyzing signals of various kinds um, while preserving the kind of local structure of, uh, of, of them. Uh, it works very well for things like, uh, like texture recognition, for example. Uh, let me skip over that. That's pretty cool, but I don't have time. Uh, over that too. And uh, uh, just to show you that uh, despite the fact I'm in a computer science department, I also do a bit of uh, real hardcore double E. Um, <laughs> right. I actually have an affiliation with the uh, ECE department at Poly, but, um, but that's very recent. And, um, and we have sort of FPGA implementations of those convolutional nets where that allow, allow us to run this uh, scene parsing system I was telling you about uh, in about 50 milliseconds per frame. Uh, so this runs on a little board about this size. And it's kind of a, what we call the, it's kind of a data flow architecture. So it's a, a grid of tiles, that each of which is programmable. And, uh, and we, we pre-configure this grid so that each operator performs a particular function. And from then on, it's passive. So one instruction says, you do a 10 by 10 convolution, and you do a sigmoid function, and you do blah, blah, blah. And so you configure all of this with you know, the right FIFO delays and everything. And then you just pump data through it, and it just the data ripples through at maximum speed, and comes out the back, and is written back to memory. Uh, so it's, it's, it's data flow. You set up your graph of operators, and it just flows through, and then writes the result. And then the next instruction is a new configuration of that grid. So it makes it very simple to, uh, to set up. And uh, recently we worked with uh, Gino Colocello's group at uh, Purdue now uh, to essentially translate this uh, implementation to a full custom uh, ASIC. Uh, so this is the result of it. Uh, it's two by three millimeters roughly, very small chip. It can do, uh, so that's kind of the grid that I was telling you about. Uh, this is the memory interface, uh, which turns out to be quite complicated. And that's kind of a little microcontroller that sort of controls the entire thing. Um, and the performance is on the order of, so this is the FPGA implementation, about 160 uh, billion operations per second uh, uh, peak. Um, or actually in practice, in real application, it's, it's, it's roughly, it's pretty much saturated. Uh, and it eats about 10 watts. Uh, the cheap version, we haven't gotten the samples back yet, but uh, we're, uh, predicting that would be about half a watt, a little more than half a watt. So this is down to the regime where you could have this in your cell phone and do real-time vision in your cell phone. Um, and th this compares with other kind of implementations using various uh, GPUs and whatever, um, which of course we beat in terms of power. Um, we're developing software tools, something called Torch 7, which I'm not gonna go into, other than just tell you what the website is. Uh, this is kind of a MATLAB-like thing for uh, experimentation machine learning. And that's my team. And I'd like to conclude with a little bit of entertainment. The first one being a little demo of a object recognition system. So I have a uh, camera here, webcam. And I can point that webcam on about anything and uh, hit a key to tell it to recognize it. So let's see. Well, here's the mouse, right? So I point it to the mouse, and I hit the M key three times. So the, the number in the square parenthesis is the number of times I hit the M key. So I've, I've stored three templates of the mouse here. So if I point the camera someplace else, it doesn't say mouse. If I come back to the mouse, hopefully it'll say mouse. Okay, so what this is, is a convolutional net of the type, the type that I showed you, showed you earlier. Um, and what I, I chopped off the classification layer. The classification layer now is basically a nearest neighbor classifier, right? So every time I hit a key, it stores a template, and it compares the 256-dimensional uh, feature vector coming out of the convolutional net to that template, and it outputs the category of the closest template. Uh, okay, so we had a mouse. Uh, that's, a, that's a cap from a bottle. I'm just gonna say C, okay, for cap. Oh, X, okay, sorry. I don't know, this is, this is gonna be called X. I hit the one key. Uh, X. Where are you? No N? Hmm. Okay, here we go. 
Um, and let's see. This is uh, Hamid. Okay. Uh, and you guys don't look like Hamid. Uh, what's your name? Why? Yeah. Okay. And him? <coughs> Hamid? <coughs> X? I type X. Uh, let's see. We have a clock down there, right? So C, clock. So clock. Hamid. Canteen. You guys are in the back here. You guys are number one. And you are number two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Now we're going to move the camera back. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. Uh, unknown. One. There's a, a few holes in the response, but uh, but basically you can use this as, as a way of for a robot, for example, to localize itself. Right. It will remember the gestalt of what it looks like, and you can kind of store this. And so you can train this to recognize, you know, a number of, of categories. And this was only trained, uh, you know, so it's pre-trained, unsupervised, trained, supervised with only about 100 categories, which have nothing to do with what, what we're looking at here. Um, the last thing I want to show you uh, is a video. And I thought I removed the sound. Okay. So this is a, a project that uh, we worked on until about three years ago, three, four years ago, called the Lagger Program, uh, uh, which means learning applied to ground robots. This is a, a DARPA-sponsored uh, program. And we were given those, those robots that we could not modify. We could not modify the hardware. We could only uh, program them. They had uh, four computers or three computers in the belly, uh, two uh, camera stereo pairs, and the system was supposed to be able to drive itself in nature purely from vision. So there's no active sensors, no, li no LIDAR, no nothing like that. So here we just have a, a stereo vision based uh, obstacle avoidance system, which works pretty well, but it has to get pretty close to an obstacle before it sees it, about 10 meters roughly. Uh, here it has to get even closer, but for other reason. And here we turn on a long range vision system based on these convolutional nets, and it sees the wall from the start. So it, it can figure out from, from here uh, that this is not something it can drive through and it gets around. So it's got a GPS coordinate that it, that it wants to go to. Here, same thing. It figures out that it has to go around this row of people. This guy is holding a RC transmitter, but he's not actually driving the robot. He's holding the kill switch. Um, and so, this, so it's one of those convolutional nets that looks at bands of images uh, kind of so that they are flat on the horizon. And the cool thing is that it trains itself as it goes. So we don't have to, I mean, we pre-train it in the lab, but it, but it, it pretty much trains itself. Um, and so what we get is we get uh, labels from stereo vision. So stereo vision can tell us if something is flat or if it sticks out. You know, from 3D reconstruction, we can tell. So uh, we generate labels of the image from that. They, they stop at about 10 meters, so we can, it can't tell us that we can go through this little passage between the two, uh, the two uh, hedges here. Um, but we can use this as labels to train our system to discriminate between what is traversable and what is not traversable. And the system, the system trains itself as it goes. Um, and so uh, we apply the, the convolutional net, which is monocular, to the entire image, and it labels the entire image with uh, whether something is traversable or not. And uh, it works pretty well. Um, the range is about 50 or 100 meters or so. It's limited by the, the map, really. So it, can, you know, it sees the trees and the hedges and the pathway and, and everything. Um, and eventually that's put into a map and, uh, which is centered on the robot and we can do some planning in the map if we have a goal uh, so that we avoid the obstacles and the unknown areas. Uh, the map is kind of centered. Uh, there's also uh, another uh, fast stereo vision based system which is designed to uh, 
uh, react quickly to unexpected obstacles when you turn around. So this is kind of three vision systems, really. Um, and that's kind of the system uh, um, in action. There's a bit of uh, training going on in the control as well. Uh, I'm skipping this. So that's, that's the learning that goes on in the, in the control. The, the sort of local uh, trajectories that the system decides to take to avoid nearby obstacles is, is, is trained uh, with a catalog of trajectories. So this is that controlling system where we cripple the vision system so its range is only about two meters, two and a half meters. Uh, this is accelerated twice. Um, and so it can do a pretty good job at sort of navigating between uh, trash cans. And here's another example in sort of more natural environment. This is my former student, Raya Hetzel, who is now working at SRI, and Pierre Sermanet, who is still a student with me, was a master student at the time. They're both pretty confident that the uh, <laughs> robot is not going to break their legs because they actually wrote the code. Uh, so the, I, I usually joke that this, it's the way I select my student. I get them to write a uh, piece of driving code for this, and if they survive, I keep them. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I would wonder if can we make the size of the theaters adaptive to the content? The <coughs> size of the patches of the theaters? Uh, adaptive to the image content? Right, so the simplest way to do this is to, uh, is to just apply the, the same system at multiple scales, yeah. which is essentially what we do in the scene parsing system, right? So you make a pyramid of images and then you apply to all, all scales. It's the way also the pedestrian detector works. So the pedestrian detector, you see it, it, it draws boxes of various sizes depending on the size of the pedestrian, but the way it actually works is that it's been trained with one scale, basically 80 pixels tall for a pedestrian. And then you, you take a pyramid of images and you apply the detector to all levels in the pyramid, and then you have a non-maximum suppression that chooses the, the scale at which the response is the, is the strongest uh, and the location at which it's strongest, and, uh, and that's, that's when you draw a, a box. And, and the, uh, the thing that you just uh, demonstrated here, you recognize your, that, that's basically in real time, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can, um, I, ca I can make it slower by, uh, by applying it to a bigger image. So uh, OK, so this is actually a much bigger image than what I showed you earlier. And so now it's a little, a little choppier, uh, but it's you know, much higher resolution. And, and now the, the, the uh, the, the detection now is more shift invariant because uh, it goes, you know, it, it applies the convolutional net to the entire image to detect the object. So here I put the clock in the center, I hit the C key, and I detect that clock regardless of where it is in the image. But if it goes off, hopefully it will shift to non clock. Hey, it's still a clock. What the hell? Um, well, that didn't work too well. Uh, uh, well, maybe it's been a little too. Uh, not, not, not specific enough here for some reason. Yeah, it's just too much, too much background. Yeah, I gotta train it discriminatively if it's too big because then there are too many hits that are possible within the image. Um, actually, this particular demo uh, uses our previous prototyping system called Lush, which actually is uh, Lisp. So there's, uh, the low level is in C, and then the top level is in Lisp. Uh, and the low level uses, you know, it, do, it doesn't parallelize very aggressively, it uses OpenMP or something. Uh, so the, the new thing that I mentioned at the end, Torch, um, is, is what, what is replacing our, uh, our, our, our list-based system. Uh, so it's uh, basically a, a numerical library and then a tensor engine written in C uh, with backends for CUDA and for ARM CPUs if you want to run this on cell phones. Um, and for OpenMP if you have uh, multi-CPU machines. And, uh, and the front end is a, a sort of interpreter compiler uh, based on Lua. So Lua is the scripting language, I don't know if you guys know. It's very much like Python, except it's much simpler, smaller, more efficient, it's got a compiler. I mean, it's much better than Python in every respect, except for the fact that it's not used as much. Uh, it's probably the most popular scripting language in the uh, video game industry, actually. 
Um, every, uh, like World of Warcraft uses Lua as a scripting language. I'm sure all of you know World of Warcraft, at least if you are non-female. Um, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.